Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is the truth. And we do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this night. We'll be doers of it. See the fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the important subject of understanding the judgment that is coming on the end time church that is under the new covenant. As they were going down these last days, we know that the judgment comes to the church first before it comes to the world. And we're talking about in Revelation 2 and 3 now, what we see which is so important to understand what's necessary for you to overcome and conquer. We know that Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Remember the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches, seven referring to completeness, referring to the whole church. He's walking in the church in this day and hour. And we've seen many things. We've already talked about how he has known your works and your works must be fulfilled before God. We talked about your labor and how you are to be laboring for him according to the word of God and your steadfastness and how that is imperative to come to the place of possessing your soul and how you come to the place of perfection and complete in all aspects, which is essential. And then how also the fact that it says here by you can't bear, but remember this means really to tolerate in this sense. You cannot tolerate or put up with those or anything that is evil. And that means that we're not going to compromise. And we brought two sessions, important sessions, on the, how you must not compromise, looking at people in the Word of God who did compromise and the big mistakes they made and the effects of it, and then those who did not compromise and overcame and did what was right. We must not compromise on anything. And so now tonight we're going to talk about the next area, and that is where it says he's, how he tried them that say they're apostles that are not and found them liars. We're going to talk about the trying and the testing and the proving of God and also how the enemy will test and try and prove you, but also how the church must test and try and prove the things that are going on in the church. It is mandatory. First we see here it's talking about them trying someone who in the church says he's an apostle. We'll get to that in a moment. We also see in verse 10, where the devil is going to cast some into prison, it says, that you may be tried. You must not ever bow to anything. Even though they'd have tribulation in 10 days, be faithful unto death, I'll give thee a crown of life. You've got to pass any and all tests and trials that would come against you from the enemy against you in your life. We also saw, see that in verse 23, when this is talking about the ones who are following the Jezebel teaching the false things that the ones who are followers are going to be, her children are going to be killed with death and all the churches will know that I am that searches the reins, which is the innermost thoughts, feelings, and purposes of the soul and the hearts. I Meaning as he's going to search them, he's going to examine them, he's going to test and try and find out what's really in your heart and what's in your soul, where your thoughts and your, your attitudes and everything that you do. And he's going to give everyone to us according to our works. We also see a point where those who pass the test are going to be protected, but at the same time, everybody in the entire world is going to be tested and tried. Look what it says in Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, it's coming, which shall come upon all the inhabited earth, not the world, this means the inhabited earth, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Everybody is going to be tested. Everybody gets tested. And the devil, of course, of course, when he's cast down with the devil and all the evil spirits, they are going to be trying to bring destruction, as we will talk about in a moment. You've got to understand that there isn't anybody that isn't going to be tested. Everybody's got to pass the test. Jesus was the one who was tested, remember? Here we see in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried, a tested, tried stone. Jesus was tested in all points, yet without sin, remember. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. 
and the one who believes in him will not make any haste or he will not be uh, having any anxiety or whatsoever ever he's going to see the God accomplish this great work in his life if he's believing and walking in his ways because just as Jesus is the sure foundation you and I are to see that foundation get laid in our life and how's it going to get laid by you hearing and doing the word God will accomplish this great work so Jesus was tested and of course how was he tested he was tested by the word that the Father told him to do. Remember, he did nothing of himself. John chapter 5, verse 30. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. Just as he could do nothing, you can do nothing of your own self. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father with has sent me. That shows you an important point. If you're going to pass the test, you can't be seeking your own will. You've got to deny yourself. You're going to seek the Father's will, or the will of which is the Word of God in the New Testament. And of course, what did Jesus do? He did everything that the Father wanted him to do. John 8, 29. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Well, that's a testimony that you and I are to have. Always do everything that's going to be pleasing unto him. And of course, the testimony was many different times. It speaks several times in the scripture. But here's one of them in 2 Peter 1, 17, where they talked about how, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He was well pleased with him. He's to be well pleased with you and me because we're going to walk in his ways and do everything that he says and follow after his way, and we're going to pass all the tests. At the same time as he passed the test that the Father gave him, he also conquered all of the enemy's temptations because the devil, of course, came and tempted him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, for he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Or well, we can conquer sin as well, remember, because now we have, have been released from the bondage and imprisonment of sin when we got born from above. We have a brand new spirit. We're not a sinner any longer. And now we can conquer all sin in our life just in the same manner. How did Jesus overcome everything? It was through the Word of God. You must understand that it's the Word that you must keep your eyes on because it's the Word that God is going to be testing you with. His Word is what you must pass the test by doing what He says. Look at Psalms 105, verse 19. This is speaking here about Joseph where he says, Until the time that His Word came, or came the Word of the Lord tried him. The Word of the Lord is going to try you and me to see whether we're going to do what he says. And if we do, then it will come to pass in due season when we've met the conditions and we do the things that he says is where his promises will come to pass. But at the same time, you're going to be tested. You're being tested by the word all the time, every day. As you're now to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you're now to walk in his ways and put the word of God first place. Now remember that before the judgment comes to the world, it is coming to the church first. We've seen this. We've seen in verse, 1 Peter 4, 17, the time has come, judgment must begin at the house of God, which is the church now. And if it first, first in time, begin at us, what shall be the end of them that are obeying not the gospel of God? Because we are to be obeying the gospel, remember. This is a present tense verb indicating the ongoing action. So this isn't talking about someone who hasn't been born again. This is talking about someone who is, who's expected to be obeying the gospel of God. Amen. Remember what it says over in Hebrews in chapter 5, after it speaks of how Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. As he was, of course, pressed and t tempted in every place and being made perfect because he did everything right. He became the author of eternal salvation to who? Unto all them that are, what? Obeying Him. Amen. Obeying, that's ongoingly. That's not just one time. That's continual obedience. 
That's why you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, always obeying, and that is ongoing action in your life. Jesus, of course, passed the test, and you and I are to pass the test. Well, Revelation 2 and 3 reveals the things that must be done. And as we mentioned, there's not only the test of passing, doing what God's Word says, of course, and, but it's also passing all the attacks that the enemy brings against you, overcoming all the trials and things. At the same time, though, there's to be a testing in the church. Look what he says. Thou hast tried them that say they're apostles and are not, and found them liars. Anybody that tries to make them something and claim it or make themselves something themselves, if they haven't been, if as, as an, isn't of God, they're a liar. And these guys tested them. And this is a problem. Not only was it a problem then, it's a problem now. I even said this recently in one of the messages earlier, but there are many ministers now that are claiming to be apostles. They want to exalt themselves, you know, like they have some great office. Many people, even one wrote, said everybody who thinks that there's somebody in the body of Christ, now they, you know, they become an apostle. They're apostle now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. If you're an apostle, what, what's an apostle, first of all? Let's just take a look at the word for a moment. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called, not called to be an apostle, a called apostle, it literally says. Separated, having been separated of the gospel of God. So you're going to be separated under the gospel. It's a call. You can't move into it yourself or think that you're going to grow into it. It has nothing to do with you growing into it. It is a call of God, and it's from Him. Galatians chapter 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So it's not by man. <laughs> These people that think that they can do it because some man supposedly prayed for them or whatever to be, and declared they're an apostle, no, it's only by what Jesus Christ has done and God the Father and a call and a ministry gift that's been imparted unto a person. Amen. We also see in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and a cross apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. It's the will of God. Otherwise, it's not man's will. It's not man deciding. It's only by the will of God. And furthermore, another point that it says, 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and apostle of Jesus Christ according to, this is the word kata, meaning according to, the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a command. People that are called to be in some office, they are, it's a command that is to be to fulfill in their life. So it's a call by God, the will of God, the commandment of God, and anybody that's going to be in this, they have to function as one who is holy. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 which in other ages was not made unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. If they're not holy, they're not going to be functioning in the office. God expects everyone who is carrying out his, the call of God to be holy and carry out all he says. Now, most of the time, what we see is these ones who are apostles were the ones who are essentially People refer them to them a lot of times as missionaries, but these are truly missionaries that have an apostolic gift that are going forth and they're preaching the gospel and establishing churches all over the place. At the same time, true apostles have these qualifications if they're truly those. Truly, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of an apostle. Oh, that means there are signs to show you're a real apostle were wrought among you in all patience, steadfastness. These guys are steadfast. In signs and in wonders and in mighty deeds, powers. These ones, meaning they're going to have the power gifts in operation. The gift of faith, the gifts of healings. They're going to have working of miracles. They're going to have the power gifts in operation as they're going forth. And that's signs, wonders, mighty deeds, powers that are going to operate. A lot of people that claim they're apostles, if they don't have those, those gifts in operation, uh, they don't have the true ministry gift. And when that gift is op, op, in operation, it will be, they'll be going preaching the gospel, they'll be doing these things, signs and wonders will be operating through them, and they'll be seeing tremendous works of God be raised up, and they'll be establishing churches. 
it's sad that these people want to tr claim these kind of things. And they're making a mistake. Unless they have the call of God, by the will of God, by the command of God, and have, and have this, this gift imparted to them, they're not one. Well, these guys were, they were having the same problem today. Everybody's got to be examined and find out, are you really one? Do you meet all the qualifications? Do you have all the things that show that you are an apostle? It, that's the only way you, if someone's going to pass the test. We see the same thing with prophets. Of course, there's false prophets that have gone forth. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. We're going to test them and examine them whether they're of God. Because there's many false prophets that are gone out into the world. Well, there's false prophets, of course, that are not even teaching the fact of, of who Jesus is, you know. You're going to know by the sp every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh would be of God. But every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. That's an Antichrist spirit. That would mean all false religions Amen. that do not believe who Je Jesus has come and He has accomplished the redemption and all these things. They are all false religions. Amen. Now at the same time, these false prophets, <clears throat> they have to be dealt with as well. We have a lot of people who are trying to claim as well today that they're prophets. If they're prophets, they should be able to, they're going to have the revelation gifts in operation. They're going to have discerning of spirits, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. They're going to have these gifts in operation. And if not, there's, there's a problem. They're not really have a prophetic gift whatsoever. Just because you prophesy doesn't mean you're a prophet. You have to have the call of God. You have to have the gifts of the Holy, the gifts placed in you that show that go along with the prophet ministry. Well, that many false ones are rising, and they're deceiving people. They think that because they claim they're a prophet, oh, I should listen to that guy, huh? Well, if you're not, if he's not bringing something forth in line with the word, there is a major problem. We see this again brought out in Second Peter two one, where he says. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So we got the false apostles, we got the false teachers, we got the false prophets. This is going on today. They bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Certainly the test of the prophet, we see back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, said, I'll raise up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. They're going to only speak what God gives them. Amen. And when they speak that, these things are, they should be absolutely coming to pass. Because they come down here to verse 21 and it says, If thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Is this going to be of God or is it not of God? And then he says this, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, this is the, that's the thing the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. He's speaking falsely. Amen. Now what we see today even, problems in which prophet, so-called prophets have spoke things and they didn't come to pass. Amen. But maybe they spoke some things and they did come to pass. But they think, and they have even said, well, you know, you may not always be 100% right on. That's false. Amen. God never misses it. If you're a true prophet and you truly have heard from the word, it's going to always come to pass. Amen. And what happens to these ones that are false ones? See, anybody that wants to claim they're a prophet, they better hear from God and speak exactly what he says and those things are going to have to come to pass or they're in trouble. Jeremiah 28 verse 1 came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah in the fourth year in the fifth month Hananiah the son of Azar the prophet he was a Gibeon spake unto me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people and he's saying I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Was that going to happen? No, they were going to go into captivity for 70 years. But he is saying something different from what already was declared. He said, Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. No, you're not going to be there 70 years. 
it's only going to be two years and you're all going to come back. Well, <laughs> who is the real deal here? And of course, he, he says they're going to bring all the captives, they're going to come all out. <laughs> I'm going to break the yoke of the king of Babylon. It's all a lie. This guy was prophesying. Look what it says in verse 15. Jeremiah confronts him and he says unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Anybody that speaks something that's not coming to pass, and you think that this is a true prophet and you'd be trusting in what he says, well, if it's not coming to pass, he's speaking a lie. He's in trouble. It'll deceive the people. But also, look what else it says. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you taught rebellion against the Lord. They're in trouble. And this is prophetic of the end time, because, so Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Remember, why is we, when we see the seventh month, why is that significant? Because that's the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, which is Tishri. That's the time of the final three feasts of the Lord, which is all the time of the fulfillment of the work in the church and the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So this speaks of the end time. And so this is speaking of the prophets that are speaking things that are wrong are going to die. And we've seen prophets who are dead today who did not speak right all the time. They paid the price. They died. There's going to be others that are going to die as well. If they're not speaking what's right, and if it's not coming to pass, there's a problem. The prophets that spoke in the New Testament, the things came to pass. That's the test. You're not making them, these guys that try to say, oh, well, sometimes you might be right, and sometimes, and, you know, it may not come to pass, but uh, well, there's something wrong there. That's not a true prophet. Amen. We also see the problem with the false teachers. Ecclesiastes. What's the teacher, what's the guy who's bringing forth the word supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be a wise preacher. Ecclesiastes 12, 9. Moreover, the preacher was wise. He still taught the people knowledge. Well, if he's not teaching them knowledge, what's he doing? He's teaching other things, his opinions, his thoughts, his rambling, on and on, stories. It's no good. Yea, he gave good heed, sought out, and set in order the many Proverbs. That would be all the scriptures on a particular subject. And then what is he going to speak forth? The preacher sought to find out acceptable word, words, which that which was written was upright, even words of truth. What should be brought in forth? Scripture after scripture, point after point on subject after subject in depth to teach the whole counsel of God. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15. He says, The ancient, the honorable, he's the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he's the tail. Now, in the Old Testament, the prophet was speaking about a spokesman. They, they, this, it was a general spokesman, not necessarily that he had revelation gifts. Because he's teaching here. This is talking about a teaching one. So this is a spokesman that's supposedly teaching the things for God. If he's teaching lies, he's the tail. Amen. And look what it says. The leaders of this people caused them to err. They were going astray. Why? Because they were hearing false teaching. They that are led of them are destroyed. Well, they're going to both be in trouble. Remember what it says over in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 15 in verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. Not only the one who's teaching the lies, but also those ones that have been listening and hearkening to the lies, which is a mistake. Well, how can I know? Just like with a prophet, the thing had to come to pass. Well, how am I going to know if this teacher is teaching me right or not? Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether the things were so. If it's not in line with the word of God, it's not coming from what God has. It is a false teaching. That is a major problem that we see. 
we see over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, over here in verse 3. And then we see this today. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We've got to have sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What does it mean to have itching ears? This means desirous of hearing something pleasant. Tell me something good. Don't tell me anything about sin. Don't tell me I you know, have to repent. Don't tell me I got to tithe. Don't tell me I got to you know, cast out the demons. Don't tell me I have to do all these things. <laughs> you got to teach the whole council. Amen. Not just nice things that they want to hear. That is a mistake. Then they shall turn away their ears from the truth, which is what's happened. And they just made their own doctrines. <laughs> That's what we see. Man's doctrines, commandments of men, traditions of men, and they're turned into fables. They turned away from the truth instead of doing what the Word says. What a mistake. You know, they've come up with, even when the Bible talks about casting out demons, and they say, well, we don't have any demons in us. Well, if it tells us to cast out demons, how could we not have any demons in us? Where'd you come up with that one from? There's no chapter and verse on that. They made that one up themselves. Same way with the people say, well, we don't have to tithe anymore. That's eliminated. Now we just can give an offering. You know, that's all a lie. Amen. Remember, anybody that's not tithing is cursed with a curse. He's robbed God, and he's not going to be protected when the judgments are poured out. That's for sure. He is in trouble. Now, we see the same thing over in Revelation. It talks about what people will compromise. And we talked about it, but the compromise can come in the area of the teaching. Here, remember where Jezebel, who was calling herself a prophetess, thinking that she could, I got a word from God, so this is okay, since I'm a prophet, you know. To teach, she's teaching something too. And seducing, deceiving my servants to commit fornication, eat things, sacrificed to idols. Now, why would she do that? Because this is at Thyatira where they had the trade unions. And the only way you could get a job was to join the trade unions and work and do all the things that, and submit to what they did. And they would commit fornication and have all kind of crazy, rousing, drunken parties and eat things, sacrificed to idols. So, well, we got to get a job. So... Well, I got a word from the Lord. It's okay to go ahead and commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. No, it's not. And what happened to them? Anybody that's compromising the word, what's going to happen? It gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. God always give people a space to repent. But if they don't repent, they're not going to get away with it. What happened then? Behold, I'll cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery meaning they're committing adulter spiritual adultery is what it is against God by violating His Word and joining themselves to, to a teaching that's contrary to the Word, doing evil things, with her into great tribulation. This shows you this is also why Revelation 2 and 3 is prior to the Great Tribulation, but right at the time when the Great Tribulation is about to occur, because that's why it says He's going to be cast into it. That's right, because the judgment's coming, and remember, all the way up to the end of the church age, and then the great tribulation comes, except they repent of their deeds. And how about the ones that follow them? I'll kill her children. Children are the followers of them with death. Boy, that's judgments. They're not going to get away with it. That's why we have to make sure that we are testing everything. These people that are just listening to people that are teaching them false things and think that it's going to be okay? No, you're going to be under judgment. you got to be sure you are hearing truth and you are making sure that it is truth and you're, you don't want to be under anything that's contrary to it. Now look here where it speaks about the false prophet coming up here in Revelation 13, 11. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast. That authority, by the way, is given to him by Satan, not by God, of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. 
And what's this guy one going to do? He's going to do great wonders, miraculous works. So he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Are you, are you going to get blown away by that? No, you're going to realize this is the evil one. You're not about to follow any after that or be deceived. But notice what it says. He deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had that had been given, not power. This is the word didymi. He'd been given to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. These things are going to happen. That's why you have to test everything. And you cannot give place to anything contrary. He had been given to give life under the image of the beast. It's going to appear like has an image that's going to be alive. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Huh. These people are going to take the mark and it's going to be all over for them. Because they're going to be deceived by this. Cause all, both great, small, great, rich, poor, free, bond, receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. They might not buy or sell or save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You cannot allow that to happen. It's all over for you if you do that. We also see in chapter 16, this is why we have to test everything. We cannot, you get deceived by something now, you could be deceived easily down the road. Revelation 16, 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. They're all speaking evil things. And they're spirits of devils that were going to be working miracles. You cannot follow signs, wonders, and miracles. And they're going to be going forth to the kings of the earth and the whole inhabited earth, this means, not world, to gather them to battle the great day of the God Almighty. And they're going to be deceived. And it's going to be all over for them. This is why everything has to be tested we can only follow that which is true. That's for sure. So, and of course, that's what it testifies down here in Revelation 19, verse 20. The remnant, remnant, remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which proceeds here. Or, I'm sorry, 20 we wanted, verse 20. The beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. See, that's why they're going to receive the mark of the beast. They're going to think, oh, look at these miracles. This has got to be the real deal. No, it's not. It's the devil operating. And those that worshiped his image, they both were cast alive in the lake of fire, of course, burning with brimstone. So, do not follow signs and wonders, and everything has to be checked out in the church. Everything has to be checked out at any time. Do not follow because someone has some notoriety. It doesn't matter what their notoriety. It means nothing. You check everything out in line with the Word of God. At the same time, remember that this testing, as we saw, he's going to be trying those ones. He's trying to destroy and kill. And we see in John, of course, chapter 10, what does the devil do when he comes to, to try and test man? What's he coming for? He's coming to steal. The thief cometh not, but for not to steal. Remember, these are not infinitives. This means that he because it's in a subjunctive mood, it will be translated that he might steal or that he may steal, as Young brings out. Same with kill and destroy, and that he might kill and that he might destroy. All these are subjunctive mood verbs indicating it's conditional. He can't kill, steal, and destroy unless the conditions are such. Well, if you walk in the way of the Lord, you use your authority, and you walk uprightly, and you're obedient, and you speak the word, walk in his ways, and you don't have any sin, you're, you're above reproach, he's not going to get to you. Amen. He says, I am come that they might be having life and might be having it more abundantly. Now, again, this is also condition, conditional, subjunctive mood. It's not automatic that you're going to be having life. You've got to meet the conditions to see the life of God and the abundant life, same thing, having it more abundantly. And this is supposed to happen ongoingly. So Satan's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And what's going to give you the victory? The word in you. So what does the devil have to do? What's he after? He's after the word in you. Luke chapter 8, verse 12. These by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. 
If the word's not in your heart, you don't have the power of God or the means to be able to overcome or conquer him or see God accomplish what he purposes, lest they should believe, of course, and be saved. He comes to try to get the word out of you. This is why you've got to make sure you conquer all temptations. Look at verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear, they receive the word with joy, but they had no root. That means there's no foundation laid, it's not established, they haven't been hearing and doing the word with a foundation, which for a while believe. But what affected them why they quit believing? Because they weren't hearing a doer and a foundation laid. In time of temptation, when the enemy came after the word, did they continue in it? No. When it says fall away, that's not a good word, it's the word apostemi, which comes from apo, away from, and histemi, which means stand. Essentially, it means they stood away from. That's exactly what they did. So it means to stand off or stand away from. They stood away. They, they didn't do the word. The enemy took it out. If you don't do the word, your enemy, enemy will take it out, and he'll be able to bring his destructive work against you. Of course, how are you going to overcome every attack of the enemy? It's going to be by the word of God. How did Jesus overcome every temptation? Matthew 4, 7. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's how he overcame. The first one was in verse 4, where he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He spoke the word that answered that particular temptation. And in verse 11, or verse 10 it is, he said, For it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It's the word that you're going to speak and you're going to do that's going to extinguish all attacks of the enemy. That's how you're going to conquer any attacks. That means if you don't have the word in you, you're in trouble. You've got to have the word in you. So you know what to speak and not fall for the temptations that would come against you. Now, you've got to understand the devil... He'll try to hinder you. Uh, he'll try to come after you. First Thessalonians chapter 2. This is when one of the earlier letters, and Paul was growing, remember? He said, Wherefore we would come unto you, I, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. It's possible for Satan to hinder us if we don't do and know what to do to conquer and overcome. But if we do, we can come to the place of not being hindered. He was growing and learning in all these things. You're going to have to make sure that you are using your authority and you're walking in line with the Word and you're not giving place to anything that would hinder you. Now, Hebrews chapter 10 also tells us, verse 38, The just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, well, that means you've drawn back from the Word, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And what have you actually drawn back to? Look at the next verse. We're not of them who draw back unto what? Perdition means destruction. If we draw back from the word, now the enemy can come in and bring destruction. The door's open. As the word goes in you is how you're going to whether walk in victory and come through or not. But of them that believe to the Preserving is a better, not saving so much, but per, the preserving or preservation of the soul because that's where the attack is. He's coming against you, trying to get to your will, trying to get to your mind, your emotions, so you'll yield to the wrong things. This is why you've got to understand, have the word in you and you've got to know how the devil works, that's for sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, look what he says. He says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. How can he get advantage of you? if you're ignorant of his devices. You can't be ignorant. You've got to know how he works. You know, it's amazing. Some of these people say, well, we don't ever talk about Satan here in our church. Oh, you don't? How are you ever going to know those devices and how he works? <laughs> That's crazy. You're supposed to teach the entire Word of God. What a mistake. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That's our responsibility through the word in us, in our heart, in our mind, in our mouth, and directing our steps. That to, to, to the, towards you being able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He has all kinds of deceitful means 
And how can he deceive you if you don't know the word? That's why you got to get the word in you so you will not be deceived. You got to be walking, of course, in line with the word so you don't be deceived in any ways so he can get to you in some way. That's why you got to watch. Get the word in you. You got to learn to take every thought captive. You got to make sure that you're not letting the devil have place in your mind. Remember what it says in 2 Corinthians 10. This has to be a life scripture for you every day of your life. You cast down imaginations, reasonings, every high thing that exalts itself or raising itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you're going to replace those evil thoughts with what the Word says, not allow that to be in you so it can have an effect upon you. Of course, while you yield to it and receive it, you open up the door for evil spirits to come into you. Having in a readiness, being prepared and ready. How am I going to be prepared and ready if I got the Word in me and I'm ready to deal with everything? To revenge all disobedience. And how's that done? When your obedience has been fulfilled. That means you're going to have to be obedient to do these kinds of things. You got to watch thoughts. You got to watch what people try to tell you to do. You got to watch if they're not telling you something in line with the Word or circumstances, anything that tries to get your attention off the Word. Don't give place to it. Always think, what does the Word say in this particular situation? And you also have to make sure that you're not yielding to anything of the flesh. Remember, sin is dwelling in the flesh. James 1.13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth the any man with evil it's talking about in the context. He doesn't bring evil things to us. No, he brings us his Word to test us to see whether we'll do it. Every man, when he's tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust, and he's enticed. He's been deceived and enticed and caught. It says when lust is conceived, because you will gave place to it, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. That's why you've got to jump on anything that is contrary to the word, coming from any kind of lust, or anything, that not, thoughts, whatever it might be, anything that's of the enemy, you must cast that down immediately. Because again, if the devil can get you off the word, he, he's got you now. You're going to give place to what he's bringing to you. Remember what happened back in Genesis? Why did we have the problem? Because God didn't have the word straight. Genesis 2.16, the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For the day you eat thereof thou shalt surely die. And so this is what he told they were, they're supposed to do. Of course, did she have it straight? No. She didn't even know what tree was in the midst of the garden. It was the tree of life. She's saying the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, that's what the tree of life God said, you shall not eat of it. He didn't say that at all. She had it wrong. And furthermore, when he said about not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she goes on and says, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. There's no recorded anything about touching it. She ha didn't have the word straight. You've got to have the word exact. You can't have the word part of it and maybe you didn't quite get it right. No, she didn't quite get it right, and it cost her. She got deceived, remember. She, man, the man was not deceived. He knew it was happening. And he, of course, listened to her and made the mistake. So you got to make sure that you have the word in you and you can't be yielding to her senses. Remember, she comes and sees the saw. The tree was good for food. Saw it's pleasant to the eyes. Oh, this looks nice. Tree to be desired to make one wise. Oh, it'll give me something that I don't have. What a mistake. You can't be moved by your senses or moved by how things look or by your feelings or anything or you're going to be deceived for sure. Amen. Now also, attacks from the enemy, you've got to be ready to deal with those because, as it says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, what are you to do when the attacks come? Greatly rejoice. You're going to rejoice, exceed, rejoice exceedingly. Because you're going to have your eyes on the Lord and you know God's going to bring you through and you're going to get total victory over it. If you're not, then why not? We must not really have confidence in Him. Our eyes are not on Him. We're being affected by the enemy's attacks. He says, though now for a season, if 
necessary. You are in heaviness through many, the manifold temptations, these attacks that the enemy is bringing. You need to be rejoicing, even though you can feel that heaviness coming at you from the attacks. Now you, what is it doing? It's trying your faith. The trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, which is your faith. Though it be tried with fire, doesn't mean you're going to crumble. Remember, you can have feelings that are negative, but your faith will bring you through. Might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ and when he comes and brings forth the victory for you. And that is whom now having not seen you love and whom though now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable full of glory as you have your faith continually applied. That means if you don't have joy, joy protects your faith. If you don't have the joy, you're in trouble. Why not? I mean, you got to look, you're affected by the tax. And receiving the end of your faith, because it shows your faith is still working. And what's it going to do? It's going to deliver you from the attack. And where's the attack come? At the soul. Even the salvation or deliverance of your soul. That means you've got to be ready to possess, have the steadfastness that we talked earlier in a message in the soulless realm, having the word established in you so you don't get moved in the soulless realm. Remember, in your steadfastness, you possess your souls. Now, you say, well, boy, I got, what about this tremendous attack that really came against me? Fiery trial. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. There can be all types of things that can come against you. Don't be moved. You keep doing what the Word says. God will bring you out of it. Rejoice insomuch as you're partaker of Christ's sufferings. He had attacks. So, you might have a big, strong, fiery trial attacks too. That when His glory shall be revealed, that means God's going to show up. That's the manifest presence of God as you're putting your faith in operation. You're taking dominion. You're speaking the Word. You're not going to give place to it. You're rejoicing, remember. You may be glad with exceeding joy when the glory is revealed, and the glory is going to be revealed because you bring Him on the scene by doing what His Word says. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. You know, this is all what happened back then. It's all what will happen for people. And it's also showing you that these attacks that will come against you, you must pass the test to see the glory of God manifest. And the glory of God is going to be manifest in what? The end time church. And what's going to happen? The spirit of glory is going to be coming and rest the God or is going to rest upon us. The glory of God is going to be filling the end time church, remember. But it's going to be for those who pass the test. You're going to pass the test, which is important. He goes on, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. Don't be moved by sufferings from other people attacking you. You do what God says. Keep your eyes on him. Don't be moved by what people do. Just give them what they have need of and just keep your eyes on the Lord and conquer and overcome the attacks. And then that's why he says the time has come. He's speaking of what proceeds here, the time where the judgment's coming, and that's going to happen. So the spirit of glory, when you pass the test on the judgment, because you are one of the righteous ones, that's who's going to get the spirit of glory resting upon them. Only the ones who pass the test are going to have the glory of God filling that end time church. And that's what's going to happen. That's the ones who are the righteous ones. Remember, with difficulty and not easily, because the attacks will come but you can overcome them all, are being saved. Remember, it's the ongoing process, present tense, continually, by God, because it's passive voice, producing that result in our life. Where should the ungodly one, it's an adjective, or the sinful one, not a sinner by nature, it's an adjective, the sinful one appear? Well, they're going to be done because they haven't passed the test. They're not going to be a part of the glorious church. They're going to have nothing but problems. Therefore, you've got to be ready to attack or deal with any attacks. Look what here over in Matthew 14. The devil will try to come at you. Here's when Peter's walking on the water. Supernatural act. 
when he saw the wind, and this is uh, when it says this wind, this isn't just talk, normal talking for wind. This is a strong, tempestuous wind, a violent one, stirred up against him, being strong and mighty. <laughs> I mean, it was an attack. Don't think of it just some little wind that came up out of the morning. This is all out, of, like a hurricane, you know, almost showed up at you, you know, essentially. Well, he got moved. He was afraid. That's not going to conquer your enemies. Beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Of course, you're going to sink if you get moved by what the enemy's doing instead of speaking and taking dominion. Jesus immediately stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said, O oh, thou of little faith. Little faith. Wherefore did you doubt? Distazo, stand in two ways. He had your eyes on Jesus, but then you got moved by the attacks of the enemy and you got into fear. Faith will conquer. Fear will give place to the enemy and it will cause you to go down as he began to sink. So that's what needs to be done. You're going to overcome and conquer. Do not be reacting to the devil's attacks. And you've got to put your authority in operation and have the power of God resident in you. It's mandatory. Remember what happened here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, talking about Paul's thorn, where God was exalting him, remember, lest I should be exalted above measure. And who was doing the exalting? God was, because it's a passive voice, meaning done by somebody else, ongoingly, the condition, though, it was conditional that this would happen. Through, through the abundance of the revelations, and all the revelation he had, he was, God wanted to exalt them so the people would receive it. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The thorn in the flesh was evil spirit that was operating against him continually when he was out going out on those missionary journeys. The messenger, angel of Satan, to buffet me continually. It was striking at him time after time after time because it's a present tense. At the same time, it was a subjunctive mood that he may be striking at me, meaning he didn't have, that doesn't mean that he had to be able to be successful in beating him up. It's only if conditions were met. Well, Paul didn't understand how to deal with this. He was still trying to handle things in the flesh at this point. And so, lest I might be exalted above measure. So what did he do? Instead of using the authority that he had and have the power of God operating through him, He's going, to seek, he's, he's going to ask the Lord to get rid of it. I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Is that going to get rid of it? Nope. God said to him, my grace, which is his favor towards us, the favor will bring us his victory, remember, is sufficient. This is a mistake in the sense that people think, oh, I'm just supposed to put up with it, I guess, put up with these attacks, beating me up left and right, hindering me. No. The word sufficient means to possess of unfailing strength and to defend and ward off. Otherwise, my grace will defend you and ward off these attacks and give you sufficient strength to you conquer and overcome. It's going to be by the power of God. For my power, dunamis, not strength, but my power is come to perfection. And that's exactly what it did. It was made perfect as ongoingly as he had the power of God in him and put it in operation. Remember, we live by the power of God. We speak the word, do what he says. In the weakness, the weakness is talking about his weakness of flesh. Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my weaknesses. Weaknesses of what? Of the flesh. Because I'm not going to operate according to the flesh any longer because I can operate in spirit instead, that the power of Christ, the dunamis, may rest upon me, and that's, I'm going to conquer and overcome, and that's exactly what he did. And he was conquering everything coming at him. See, so therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, any weaknesses, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, doesn't matter what's coming at me, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak in flesh, then am I strong meaning I am powerful, meaning it, he, I'm, it doesn't matter what I am in the flesh. It only matters whether I have the power of God operating in me. 
And if I have the power of God operating me, I can be able to defend, ward off, and have fail, unfailing strength to conquer everything that comes against me. And that's what he learned to do. And he learned to do what needed to be done to put God in operation to give him victory. But the devil will come against you, and he can try to attack you, but that doesn't mean he can prevail against you unless conditions are met. But if you operate with your authority and with the power of God, and you speak for the Word of God, put God in operation, you're going to see victory over every attack of the enemy. Also, you must understand the things that we see in the past. Remember, the end is declared from the beginning. There's nothing new under the sun. The things that have been said before are going to happen again. We've seen that in, in Ecclesiastes and also over in Isaiah, those, those statements. Daniel, you're going to see this. is going to come. Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar has an image made, just like we know that the image is going to be made of this Antichrist for everybody to fall down and worship. They had to fall down and worship the golden image. If you didn't fall down, you're going to be cast in the midst of a fiery furnace. You're going to be killed. So, of course, were the three Hebrew children going to do this? No way. Of course, they came and they said that uh, every man's supposed to do this, and whoever not, doesn't gets going to cast into the fire. And they said, there's certain men here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that have not regarded thee, and they're not. They serve your gods or worship the gold image that you set up. You cannot worship any of the false gods. You cannot worship that image or take the mark or anything. God is going to deliver you if you meet the conditions. Remember. Of course, he brought these men before him and, you know, get, told them what they had to do and told them if you had a, you know, we're going to give you another chance if you fall down and you'll be, if not, you're going to be cast in the same hour in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And then they throw the dart at them, try to affect their faith. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? You got to know who will deliver you. And you got to know that when you speak God's word, he's going to come on the scene and their angels are going to work on your behalf that will minister for you to deliver you out of the situation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, you throw us in the furnace. He said, you have, we are, my God's not going to deliver me. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning furnace, and he will. Not just that he's able. He will deliver us out of thine hand. Amen. You're going to speak it and being and declare what he's going to do. And then, if not, if you don't get thrown in the fiery furnace, be it known to thee, O king, will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Otherwise, you've got to take an uncompromised stand, which we talked about. And of course, they came through, and they got delivered. And, and what happened? Angel. It was the angel. God sent his angel and delivered the servants that trusted in him. That's right. You trust in him, you're going to put God in operation. He will deliver you and bring you out of it. Remember the promise that we see if you meet the conditions in Psalms 91. you got to know what God will do. Of course, the whole thing is really talking about, really from an end, any time, but an end time perspective as well. If you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, you abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He's your refuge and fortress. You're trusting in him. He will surely deliver you from anything that's going on. God will surely deliver you. He's going to protect you. He's going to be, your, the truth is going to be the shield and buckler because you're going to speak the word against any and all attacks of the enemy. You're not going to be afraid. You get in fear, eh, you're in trouble. You cannot be afraid, otherwise now the hedge is down. Remember, that's what happened with, jo with Job. For the terror by night or for the arrow that flies by day. Nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand will fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, it shall not come nigh thee, because you're going to smite them all. They're not going to get to you. You're going to walk in victory. You, Only your eyes will behold, see the reward of the wicked. They're all going to be judged, remember. But those who have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, your dwelling place, because you abide in Him, hearing and doing His word, what's going to happen? No evil shall befall thee. Well, that means the enemy's not going to get to me. Neither shall any plague come by my dwelling. 
All those plagues, doesn't matter what kind of virus they, they come up with, it's not going to get to you because you're going to conquer it all. You're going to walk in victory. He'll give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, guard you in all your ways. Because of course, you're going to speak the word. You know the angels will hearken to the voice of the word and go forth to accomplish these things. They'll bear thee up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. You're going to tread the enemy underfoot. That means you're going to use your authority. The young lion, the dragon, you shall trample under your feet. You have to use your authority. You have to operate as a king, remember, as you're serving him. We talked about that in Hebrews chapter 12, about that, how you're going to, you get receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. You're going to serve God with reverence and godly fear, and you're going to conquer the enemies. Because he set his love upon me, because you're going to do the word, therefore will I deliver him. See, you've got to meet the conditions for him to deliver you. I will set him on high because he's known my name, because you're going to speak in the name of Jesus, the name above every name. It's going to bring the authority on the, that's the authority. It's going to bring and the power of God and the promises come into pass. He shall call upon me and I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. Any kind of trouble. And he'll deliver him and honor him. God will deliver you. But you've got to have, meet these conditions. With long life I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. These are the promises. But you've got to meet the conditions and he'll bring you through the attacks. The key thing in an attack will be the word in you and then you putting it in operation. Whatever comes at you, you're well able to overcome it, but you got to make the right choice. If you yield to the fear, you're in trouble. You yield to the attack in some way, you don't trust in him, you get double-minded, you're in trouble. Look what he says in Deuteronomy 30:19. I call heaven and earth the record of this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. You've got to make the right choice. And what are you going to choose? The Word. You're going to choose what God says to do in the Word. You're going to act upon the Word and put Him in operation. Now, the devil will try to come, use all kinds of things to come at you. You've got to be ready and understand this. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, that's the devil trying to do that. And what's he, then it tells you all the things he's going to use. Well, he might use tribulation, pressure, distress, calamities, afflictions, persecution, attacking you, famine, nakedness, peril, any kind of danger, the sword, Remember, they got delivered from the attacks of those alien armies, you know, through their faith in Hebrews 11. You can get delivered from anything if you put your faith in operation and you meet all the conditions. Notice, this is what he thinks of you. As it's written, for thy sake, you're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. And that's exactly what these people who are going to be led by the devil are going to be vessels of the devil are going to try to be doing. They're going to be trying to kill everybody off. Can of sheep is for the slaughter. No. No. In all these things, not that we're more than conquerors, because this is a verb, not making a state of who you are. It says, instead, in all these things, we are continually, completely victorious. Present tense verb, ongoingly. First person. Plural, meaning we. We are continually victorious. It doesn't matter what comes. If you do the word, you conquer. You see, you've got to pass the tests and the trials and attacks that the devil will bring against you. That's why you've got to pass the test now. If you don't pass the test now, when the greatest pressure that's ever come to the world comes, you got, if, you're, if you can't do it now, what's going to happen then? So now is the time to get yourself strong and overcoming everything in your life. The same word, same principles, same authority, power, same faith you have will work. It'll do the same thing. But remember, the pressure is going to be ramped up like you wouldn't believe compared to what it is now. So you've got to be ready. I'm persuaded. Ah, you've, got to have, you've got to have that belief and that faith. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things to come, it doesn't matter what it is, 
nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And the love of God is the fact you're going to do His word. You're going to do His commandments. And remember, when you do it, He's going to come and make us abode in you. He's going to man manifest Himself to you, remember. Huh? That's going to be the glory of God coming to deliver you. And man, that's why the glory of God's going to be on the end time church because they walk in line with the word and that glory of God will not only operate to do mighty things through them, but it will keep them victorious and protected. The enemies will not get to you when the manifest presence of God is operating in you. That is where we're coming to. And you got to understand that anytime a temptation comes, think about what the word says. Don't crumble or yield to it. Hebrews 2.18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to help them that are tempted. God's your help. He'll help you in every situation. Think what the Word says so you can overcome. Don't get moved by what's attacking you and crumble. That will take you down. You can't give place to that. And of course, you've got to learn to watch and pray so you don't enter into any temptations, remember. The devil's attacks will come. Matthew 26, verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. You could enter into it. Remember, the temptation is not sin, and it doesn't bring de destruction. It's whether you enter into it, give place to it. Then you're in trouble. Just like when the lust conceives, then it brings forth sin and produces the death. The spirit indeed is willing or ready, but the flesh is weak. That's why you can never operate in the flesh are you going to go down for sure because the flesh is strengthless. It is not able to conquer anything. It's the operating in spirit according to the power of God, doing what the Word says, you're going to conquer everything. And remember, we already saw some of the scriptures about rejoicing, but you need to learn to rejoice when anything's coming. James 1, 2, count it all joy when you might fall into or be encompassed about with diverse temptations. The rejoicing is important because that joy is, is that fortified place of protection that will protect your faith so you don't crumble in the soulish realm and give place to the enemy. That is important. And you also got to know, anytime any attacks from the enemy come, God will bring you out of it. He'll show you how to, how to go out of it. You have to do what the Word says. No temptation has overtaken you or overtaken you here, taken you such as common to man. God's faithful. He won't suffer or leave you uh, to be tempted above your able, but with a temptation, he'll make a way of escape to come out from it so you don't yield to it. That you may be able to bear, stand up against it, this means to be able to endure and stand against those attacks that might come against you. And remember, in, as we saw in Revelation, Who's going to be kept from the trial coming on everybody in the earth? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, Revelation 3.10, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. This is just covenant, isn't it? You keep the word of his patience, he's going to perform it and do what, what the, the blessing is, the promise, which is to keep you from the hour of temptation and protect you, which will come upon all the world, all the inhabited earth, to try them that dwell on the earth, everybody yeah, it's all going to happen. You also have to know that God will always know how to deliver you out. You've got to get the Word in you and be ready to do the Word. Not just know it, you've got to be ready to do it. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly, and that's going to be the key, of course. You think if you're going to get out of it, if you're ungodly, it's not going to happen. The godly out of temptations. And, of course, what's going to happen for the ones that aren't? He's going to reserve the unjust for the day of judgment to be punished, and they will not get away with anything. But you've got to be approved when the attacks come. Remember James 1.12. Blessed is the man that is enduring, remaining steadfast in the temptation. This is a poor translation. It doesn't mean for when he's tried, just because he got tried. This word for means because, if you see below, and then there are two words here. The word ginemai is the verb, which it means become, becoming in this sense, approved, which is the other word, 
accepted or approved. The translation accurately would say because becoming approved. And why would he be approved? Because he didn't yield to it. He conquered it. He overcame it. Otherwise, are you going to get any victory if you, if you don't are approved of conquering the temptation? No. Because he becoming approved, he shall be able to lambano, take hold of the crown of life. And what's the crown for? Well, the crown's because you got the victory. <laughs> That's why. It's the Stephanos crown, not some crown just because I endured some temptation. It's because you got victory. The crown of victory is only given to the victors. You've got to have to get the victory. And God will always cause you to triumph in all things in Christ, remember. Which the Lord has promised to who? Remember what it said about those that set their love upon him, will deliver him? Same thing. Those who are loving ongoingly him, which means those that are walking in his ways, keeping his commandments, doing what he says, overcoming in every situation. Now also, you've got to understand that God's going to test everybody. And if you need to pass all the tests, God tests man, he does. He will test or try to man. Here it uses the word tempt, but it really means to test, essentially. This is talking about Abraham. God did tempt, test, try, prove Abraham. Going to find out whether he's the real deal, isn't he? He's going to find out whether you're the real deal, if you're going to do the word or not. He told him, take your son up there, and you're going to offer him there for a burnt offering. <laughs> well, that my, uh, that's, that's something. And yet he's going to obey and go up there, and he does exactly what he's supposed to do. Now he gets him, he's all ready to go through a knife to slay the son. And the angel said, calls to him out of heaven, and he says, Here am I. And he says, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do I anything unto him, for now I know you fear God. That, that tells you something. He had to prove himself. He passed the test. This also shows you that God does not know what you're going to do until you do it. Now I know you fear God, indicating he tells you what to do, but he'll find out whether you really do by your actions and obedience. See, and thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. He passed the test. You've got to realize that God's word is given to you. That's what's going to find out whether you're going to walk in his ways or not. Remember in Exodus 16, 4, where he rained bread from heaven for him. And remember, that was the physical bread. The people go out and gather a certain rate every day that I might prove them. But it's also pointing towards the word of God, which is the real bread from heaven. Because he goes on and says, whether they will walk in my law or not. God gives you his word. Jesus is the word, the bread from heaven. To find out whether you're going to, he's going to test you to find out if you're going to walk in it or not. How does he know you? By your fruit and by your works and by your, your, what you're doing consistently. That's why you've got to be a doer of the word. If you're not a doer of the word, he knows that there's something wrong. You can't just be a hearer only. Look what it says here in Exodus 20, 20. Fear not. God's come to prove you. He's come to test you. That his fear may be before your faces. If the fear of God's before you, you're not going to be sinning because you know judgments are going to come. If you walk in sin, you're going to have destruction coming. God will prove you. That's why you've got to always do what the Word says and not give place to any sin. Deuteronomy 8. God's going to test everyone. Here he speaks about the way he led them 40 years in the wilderness. And here's the purpose, to humble them. You've got pride, you're going down. The prideful ones won't get anywhere. Remember, that's what happened to Satan. Pride took him down. He'll take everybody down. He resists the proud. Gives grace to the humble. And to prove thee. He's going to test you and know what was in your heart. What's in your heart is going to be evident by whether you would keep his commandments or not. Whether you do the New Testament commandments. You've got to walk this walk and be obedient. And so he humbled them. Suffered him to hunger, fed him with manna which they knew not, neither their fathers knew, that he might make thee know man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God doth man live. The word's what you live by. This is why 
If you don't have the Word in you, how are you going to be able to live by it? You've got to get the Word in you. This is why, of course, what I do all the time. I'm just giving you the Word, sharing you the Word, teaching you the Word, meditate on the Word, getting all this, taking all these scriptures and putting them all and setting them in all order and bringing them forth on every single scripture. Exactly what it says. we got to have the Word. That's the only way you're going to walk in victory and overcome. Amen. And look what he said down in verse 16. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee. Absolutely, you've got to be humble or you're never going to come through. That he might prove thee, he's going to test you. And what's the purpose? To do thee good at thy latter end. Everything he does will be for doing good for you. He's not going to bring evil on you. He's going to do good things for you if you are humble, if you're proving, you're tested and passed the test of doing what he says. In fact, he also, look what he says also about his testing it's going to find out whether you really love the Lord or not. Deuteronomy 13, 3. He says, The Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You can't just say it. It's going to be shown by your actions, by your works, by your fruit, by what you're meditating on, what you're doing, what you're speaking, what you're thinking upon, what's in your heart. Have you been guarding your heart? What's in your mind, in your soul? And what are your will? And you're making the your thoughts that you have. That is going to show who you really are. At the same time, some people think, well, God will tell me everything to do. N no, not so. I think he's going to lead you every second of the way by telling you something. Some people, they're always looking for voices and stuff. This is talking about Hezekiah. Look what it says in verse 31. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire the wonder that was done in the land. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Where's God? He, he wasn't, he wasn't going to manifest himself to him. He left him to find out what's in your heart. What are you going to do? See, you got to have the word in you. If you have the word in you, you got God in you, of course. And he's going to test you and find out what all is in your heart, evidence will be because you're going to do, you know, the word in your heart is going to give you the motivation. Out of the abundance of hearts, what you'll be speaking. From your heart, you'll be doing everything that God wants you to do. It's interesting. God left him to try him. He left him alone. Some people say, well, maybe did God allow me to do such and such? No. <laughs> as far as if you did evil, he would always show you, he gave me his word or what to do and find out what's in your heart. But it's a case here showing that God did leave and he wasn't there just to respond just because you're, you wanted him to tell you what to do. He expects you to get the word in your heart and have the heart right so you'll do what is right, see, in regardless of what situation you might have. And he's going to prove you in every aspect. Look what it says in Psalm 17, <clears throat> verse 3. Thou hast proved mine heart. Remember, he looks upon our heart, doesn't he? Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. Wow, that's what we want. When he tests you, he should not find nothing. And there's no, I don't see anything wrong with you. You've got a perfect heart. I'm purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. That's going to be a key. Because remember, if you're speaking wrong with your mouth, you're deceiving your own heart. You're polluting your heart. That's where your words are so important. Purpose that your mouth shall not transgress. You're only going to speak right words. That is key. Get the word in your heart. Guard your heart. Make sure you only speak right things. Psalms 26, 2. Examine me. Try. Prove me. O oh Lord, examine me. Essentially, scrutinize me and prove me. Test and try me. Try my reins. This is again this area of the soulish realm and my heart. We shouldn't be afraid to have God come and try everything. Because if there's something that's not right, we want him to deal with us on it. We want everything right. So, no problem. Examine me, Lord. Try me. Test me. See what's in my soul and in my heart, whether things are right or not. Psalms 139. Verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. 
We shouldn't be holding back from that. People say, oh, I don't know if I want God to do that. Well, of course you do. So if there's something wrong, you get it dealt with. We shouldn't be afraid. If we're afraid of that, then we must have something wrong. You got pride in your heart? You got doubt in your heart? You got thoughts that aren't right? <laughs> they got to be straightened out and come in line with the Word. And you must understand that He's going to give every man according to his ways and the fruit of his doings. Look what it says in Jeremiah 17, verse 10. See, everybody's going to be tested. And if you're going to be a part of the glorious church, remember you're coming on to, going on to perfection, righteous and holy. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Do you have every man according to his ways? Your ways are what you're hearing and doing and walking after. And according to the fruit of his doings, that's going to be the result of your ongoing doings because you're walking ongoingly. Remember, he knows you by your ongoing walk, continually, by the things that you do. And look what it says here in Daniel, the things that are coming in the end time. Daniel chapter 11, verse 35. He's speaking in end time there when he's telling them about uh, at the end here different things of what happened. And then he says, Some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge, to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it's yet for appointed time. People are going to be tried. They're going to be tested. If they pass the test, they'll be purified. And they'll come to the place of being white. And only the ones that are white, remember, the ones that have got the, they're the ones that have the marriage garment on, remember. And that's because they passed the test. We see the same thing declared in Daniel 12. Verse 9 talks about how things were sealed up to the end there at that point. But now in verse 10, he says, many shall be purified. They're going to be purified. They're going to be made white. They're going to be tried and tested. But the wicked will do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. They won't. Because they're going to get wiped out. If they haven't come to the Lord, they're not going to understand. But the wise shall understand. You're going to understand all the things that are happening because you see what the Word says. You know what's coming. You know what's going to happen. You're not going to be moved. Malachi chapter 3. Look what it says here. It speaks of him suddenly coming to the temple. And he says, who may abide the day of his coming? You've got to be holy and righteous and pure with God before God. Who shall stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's washer's soap. He's going to wash you clean and burn up everything that's not of God. If not, you're going to be in trouble. Because what are you to be? He'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi were the priests. Remember, what are we today? We're the priests. So this is in the New Testament sense saying he's going to purify the priests. He's going to purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, which you and I are to be an offering in righteousness. You can't be anything but righteous. If you're unrighteous, you're not going to be an offering to the Lord. You'll be cast aside. You're going to hear, depart. Or the lawless ones, depart from me, remember. You're to be an offering in righteousness. And it's interesting also, there's one area where it talks about us testing him and proving him, and that's the area of the tithe. And because remember, these people that won't tithe, he said, well, the man robbed God, you robbed me, yet you say, where have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? God robbers. They're not going to get anywhere. They're going to go down for sure. They're cursed with a curse because they've robbed him, the whole nation. But then he says, bring all the tithes in the storehouse, there may be meat in my house, and prove me. This is an area where all the time it talks about God proving us, but this is an area where he says, prove me. You're going to prove God. You're going to test God. If I'll not open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing, not room enough to receive it, God's blessings will come upon those who are tithers. He said he'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes, but not destroy the fruits of your ground. Otherwise, the, dumb, the devil's not going to get to you. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. You're going to be blessed. All nations will call you blessed. You'll be a delight some land. You're going to be blessed in every way. Amen. And that's so important. 
And remember what it comes down here and says, the ones who fear the Lord, who are the ones who tithe, how a book of remembrance is written before them for them that fear the Lord. Oh, those are the tithers. They shall be mine. It's amazing, these people that won't tithe. It's all over for them. If they don't come to repentance, they're going to be done. In that day when I make up my jewels, my valuable pressure, possession, and I will spare them. Oh, that means they're going to be spared? And when's that going to be? When all the judgments are poured out, as a man spares his own son that serves him. And notice what he says. He tells you the ones who are tithing and the ones who aren't, what they're called. He'll return to discern between the righteous, that's the tither, and the wicked, the one who's not. Him that serves God, him that serves him not. And the day comes, burns in the oven, all the proud, and yea, the do wickedly, will be stubble, the day shall burn them up. The Lord of hosts shall leave them neither, neither root nor branch. They're going to be all burnt up. But what about the ones that are walking right with him and that have feared his name and the ones that are tithers and ones that are walking uprightly, the righteous ones? Well, the Son of Righteous is going to rise with healing his wings. They're going to go forth and they're going to grow up as calves of the stall. They're going to tread down the wicked. They're going to conquer. There'll be ashes under your foot in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. You're going to conquer everything. That is what God is going to bring forth. It's mandatory that you and I come to the place of understanding that you and I must walk in the way of the Lord. All the, tri the trials are going to come. He's going to prove every single one of us. Remember, whatever he sees of the fruit, whatever he sees of the, your doings, whatever he sees of what your heart is like, what your soul's like, what your thoughts are, what your actions are ongoingly. That's how he knows you. And you see, he comes to the place and he sees that you are one who's kept the word of his steadfastness, as we saw. That's the guy who's going to be kept from the hour of temptation. And it's coming. It's going to come upon the entire inhabited earth to try everyone who's dwelling on the earth. This is why, passing the test. So we got to pass the tests of the devil's attacks. We got to pass the tests of God's word, showing that he, we are loving him, walking in his ways, walking in all of his ways, doing everything he says. And also we got to pass the test within the church to make sure that we don't have any false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, false brethren, false things going on and that is critical, especially in this day and hour with all the doctrines of devils that are out there and seducing spirits and false stuff that's being taught. It's astounding. So we're going to pass the test. And that's, of course, part of what, why we're doing it. We, always, it's, we bring these things out when there are things that have to be addressed. We address the doctrinal things and point out the ones that are false. You've got to address them. It's not trying to be always talk about the negatives that other people are doing. You have to bring them out. They have to be examined. They have to be tested. They have to be exposed. They, everything has to be tried. And everything has to be proven that it's right before God. And as we pass all these tests, ah, we're going to be kept from the hour of temptation. And we'll be protected. We'll have met the conditions. God will deliver us. And we will see victory. We'll pass the test of the church, the judgment on the church and have the glory of God upon us, the spirit of glory coming on us. And we'll come through throughout the time of the tribulation until the rapture being presented unto the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God in Revelation 2, revealing another aspect of the judgment that's coming on the church. Everyone will be tried, tested and proved to see whether they're following the way of the Word of God and pleasing unto the Lord. I will pass the test because I will hear and do the Word and walk in line with the Word and obey God in all things. I will pass the test of the devil's attacks because I will have the Word in me and I will speak the word, and I will resist the enemy, and I will not give place to any temptations. I will overcome, 
any and all attacks that come against me. And I'm also testing within the church the things that have come forth. So we only have the true and none of the false. I thank you as we test everything within the church and we also test ourselves through the Word of God, God's testing in our life to find out if we're going to follow the way of the Lord, which we will, evidenced by our works, our fruit, our ongoing doing, and then also conquering all attacks of the enemy, not giving place to anything. As we pass the test, we will be victorious. We will be kept from the hour of temptation. We will have the glory of God poured out on us, the end time church. That spirit of glory will be upon us and we will go forth and do all that God calls us to do. And we will come through and be kept and protected during this time of temptation that will come upon the whole earth. Thank you, Father. I will pass the tests that you bring to me of the word and I will conquer all of Satan's attacks and I am also testing and trying everything in the church so I'm not contaminated by anything that is false. Thank you for accomplishing this. It's all through the word of God that I'm hearing and doing. I thank you for bringing this forth that I will pass the test in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to pass the test. That's it. That's the only way. You have to. And we're going to do it. We can do it. It's all through God, remember. You can't do anything in the flesh. It's all through the Word in you. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be hearers and doers of this Word. We will pass all the tests. Thank you for the revelation of this. And we'll make sure that we are doing what your Word says. So we will be kept there because of us keeping the word of your patience. Thank you for all you brought forth. We will be victorious as we hear and do your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord.